Brian Merton from Lucasfilm. Everybody, Brian Merton! Well, thank you all for, for coming, and uh, it's really good to be back on people. Uh, well, the first time in a, in a while is just, um, I, talking to my, my boss, and it was the first time that I've seen him face to face in like two and a half years, so it's just really odd to go with. Um, uh, for those of you who've been to the panel before, um, I'd like to introduce a uh, a brand new segment to the panel, and um, the segment is going to be called uh, the uh, Collector Interview. And for our first um, Collector fan, his name is Gabe Estrada, and he will be escorted in by another very special guest, a man in black, and I believe they're making entrance from the back. <laughs> <laughs> it took a little bit of um, conniving to get Gabe to come and do this. So, uh, I thank them, but they'd probably kill me. <laughs> um, so, one of the things I've been uh, thinking about for the last two years is what, the, what I should talk about from this panel. And one of the things I'd like to talk about is um, I'd like to focus on authenticity um, and what authenticity means to, to these people, to you, and in your, in your journey <laughs> through your own Star Wars story. So, um, I'd like to introduce Gabe Estrada, who is a collector, and uh, yeah. but he's a super collector, and I'd like to ask him uh, to tell you about uh, how he came to be a Star Wars fan and what authenticity means to him. And I have to explain to him that the green button sends the program forward. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, I, I, I'm a collector, obviously, as probably most of you. Um, and kind of my story comes from when I was a child, right? as most of us, right? We, we fell in love with these collectibles, we fell in love with either the original figures, um, or just Star Wars in general. Um, I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was about eight years old, and I didn't speak English. I didn't, literally, just, I only spoke Spanish. And the only English that I did speak were Star Wars lines. <laughs> because I grew up, you know, in, in a country where the, the authenticity of something meant that it was American, right? And, you know, we, we get you know, bootlegs and then the, the, the authentic things. Um, even the, the Star Wars figures, right? It was in Mexico. Now I know that Lily Levy is... The, the, the ones to go with, but back then, I would always look for the yellow bags, right? Because that was the, the authentic thing. And I would memorize these Star Wars lines. And so when me and my family came to the United States, um, we, you know, a kind of typical immigrant story, right? I, I didn't speak English, but my way into, with friends and all that was, you're Star Wars. I mean, literally, that was my kind of introduction to American culture. And I, loved it ever since and i've always had this passion for for star wars um and in fact as you know growing up we didn't have a lot of money uh, I, I grew up in a, in a one bedroom apartment with essentially six of us right? a bunch of siblings and my parents but my parent and my li the living room was my room and my parents were just the best parents because even though it's the living room they would let me put up my collectibles. And you know, obviously I didn't have too many, but my dream was always to have a real lightsaber, or a real you know, helmet, or a real blaster. 
So, you know, my, my parents would let me display that. And obviously, you know, through, through a lot of hard work and, you know, determination, um, I, I, I got through the, the American system. And I, I went to school and I actually I ended up becoming an attorney, um, which allowed me to be kind of a, a super collector. Um, <laughs> so, it, when, when speaking about you know authenticity and all that, to me, I, I, I really focus on licensed prop replicas because again, I have this deep connection with Star Wars in, in a sense of you know it's not only was it part of my childhood, but to me, it's it's the authentic piece, right? To me, that, that the fact that I can say, look, this have the certificate, this comes from lineage, from the archives, and, and, and it, here it is. Um, to me, it's, I mean, it means so much. And especially thinking back to the little eight-year-old kid, um, to even think about being able to walk into my collection room now as, you know, as that little eight-year-old kid who didn't speak uh, English, it's just mind-blowing to me. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. And um, it's, it's interesting how Star Wars, just regardless, um, it, it connects us all, right? It connects us, and it, it, it literally connected two countries for me, right? Not speaking English, and I think it continues to do so. I mean, Star Wars is one of those threads that just continues to to bring people. You know, there's a lot of division in the world. There's a lot of division, uh, politics, and everything. But the one common you know, thread is Star Wars. And again, I, I I'm just I feel so fortunate, and this is my American dream. Right here, right to me, um, and again, it's people like everyone here on this panel that essentially have made my dreams come true. Right, my childhood dreams. Like I now own them, and I can go into my room and see things that I can only imagine. Right, I grew up on uh, from Star Wars to Jedi. Right? Me and Tom had this conversation. We grew up on you know from Star Wars to Jedi. I remember seeing that pan of all the maquettes, and then all of a sudden. Regal Robot has those maquettes, and I can have them in my collection. So, again, this is my American dream, and I just wanted to show you, you know, and kind of share my story of what made me a Star Wars fan, and why it's so important to, for me to have an authentic piece. Great, thank you. Yeah, some people call what, you know, what these people here do um, products, and I hate to call them products because they're really experiences. Everything that these people make, it's a Star Wars experience, and it's how people, ex how, it's how they experience um, Star Wars, how you, you remember and think about the story um, that you love. And the thing that I'd really like to be able to get across today, or have everybody here get across today is ju just how passionate they are about Star Wars and how seriously they take what they do and how much they love what they do. Um, so next we have Annabeth Von Slee and she's representing Sideshow and I'd like to ask her a couple of questions. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah, it's okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, um, tell us about your first experience with Star Wars, and has it changed the way you work on Star Wars? Uh, I think my first impressions and interactions with Star Wars was the Ewok Village. Um, my Barbies and Gemdells spent a lot of time there, they preferred it to <laughs> Castle Grayskull. Um, I also had a few Princess Leia figures, some of the earlier Tanner figures, and I, I love the fabric and the cut and sew element. I wish, wish they had a little more articulation, though, which is kind of ironic because it's sideshow. You know, I work on statues, which are not articulated, but we have fabric as well. Um, okay, so, well, we want to talk about authenticity, so why don't you tell all my friends here, what authenticity means to you uh, as a Star Wars fan? Sure, I think um, my knee-jerk reaction when I think of authenticity is knowing something about everything, but when I kind of reflect on that a little bit more, it's not necessarily being able to 
you know, teach a class on a, on a universe. It's more about how it makes you feel and how you love that thing. You know, it's really, it takes a lot of bravery to really love something like, shamelessly with the joy of a child. I think really true authentic fans, you can see that brave love for the world and that comes from that deep connection with the character that you know, Gabe was just talking about where you know, you are walking out of a movie theater or when the credits start to roll on some of the recent amazing TV series um, where you really see yourself reflected in this character in this other galaxy, you know, this gunslinger or this brave princess and you see yourself reflected in that character and, and then you have that deep emotional connection that you carry with you throughout your day and your interactions and it might just, you know, be an interaction in traffic or with a coworker or with a family member, but that, that character is inside of you when you have that interaction. That's authenticity, I think. And so I've been um, lucky enough to walk through the sideshow halls and it's a, a pretty impressive place and I definitely get the feeling that, um, that there are a lot of like-minded people there. <clears throat> All right, um, so let's, uh, I know you have a slide show prepared, and I'm excited to see it. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's sort of, that's how we approach product design at Sideshow. So uh, what I wanted to share with you today is um, our Darth Vader product. When we think about a character, there's different ways that people connect with the character on different emotional levels, and that's really where we start. Um, we'll take a character like Darth Vader and sit down as a group and really talk about the different ways that people emotionally connect with the character and then we'll look to develop, you know, different pieces that connect with that in, inside the fan, inside of us and inside of, you know, our audience. Um, so a good example of this is the you know, four different products that we currently have in the marketplace. This is our Darth Vader, Lord of the Sith, premium format figure. Um, premium format for Sideshow means it has a posable cut and sew element, his cape, and in this case also his um, saber lights up. But this is really Darth Vader as an expression of power, and power that has come at great cost and sacrifice to him. So he's standing you know, on top of the castle in Mustafar where you know, he really had a showdown with Obi-Wan where he lost everything. And this, this moment kind of takes place between the prequels and episode four. So we also wanted to kind of serve some of that more movie accurate costuming. There's definitely some fans that want to see screen representations of characters and we wanted to make sure that we serve that desire. Um, <coughs> You know, he has the, um, a swap out arm, so he's got his you know, two major power expressions too, with his lightsaber and a force hand, and he's got so much tension in him and so much power, but it is a very, it's that dark anger. Um, but the power and the beauty of that, I think a lot of people, you know, anger is a very motivational force. And so that, that's what we wanted to capture with, with this piece. Um, we also have our Darth Vader mythos piece, um, and I, I wanted to showcase here, this is really about the, the inner conflict of this character and the battle. I think a lot of people connect with him as a figure of redemption. So as you can see, we have a fully masked portrait as well as fully unmasked and this sort of battle damaged in between because this character really goes through, you know, I think one of the most compelling arcs of any character you know, in the Star Wars galaxy. And you know, as Anakin, he's one of the best pilots in the galaxy, so it's very significant thing that he's standing on the burning X-wing turbine, you know, and he's he's ripped up physically, but also that reflects, you know, on the inside, like who he was, who he's become, what it cost him to get there, and you know, some of the the anguish and doubt that comes along with that are. We also have our. Um, slightly on the more lighter side of the dark side. Uh, we have our, our designer vinyl, and this is um, a really cool piece by the artist Jesse Hernandez. Um, it also has a, a light up feature, um, but it's, uh, Jesse's artistic prerogative is really to bring like ancient cultures from like Mesoamerica and mix that with the character. So we really felt that that was a compelling marriage between a character who's really you know, patriarchal, but highly symbolic, and really key to the Star Wars universe, 
but to take you know, an ancient American, Mesoamerican theme and marry that from a design perspective. Again, it's the expression of power, the darkness. I mean, really almost like a mythological kind of God interpretation of the character. And we thought that really brought a new and interesting expression to the character and to the marketplace, and also to you know introduce a new artistic voice as well. And then last but not least, um, you know we have a very prolific art print program. This is um, Marco Mastrazzo. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing his last name, um, but this was inspired by, and that's one of the really cool things about SciShow too. We're a community of artists, and so. Um, you know, part of within our own community, we inspire each other. And Marco is inspired by the mythos piece to do this print, and he was able to kind of take the artistic statement from that, digest it, and create this piece, which he brought his own additional storytelling to that. So it's inspired by that, but there's more storytelling like within the scene itself here. Um, the pose is a little bit different. There's some more background elements. Um, but it really starts to, to flesh out the story and, and create, and he gets to like add to that story that you know the designers and sculptors and painters for the mythos piece had started. He can continue that on. All right. So. <laughs> So Sideshow, we wanted to give away uh, one of the, the prints, right? Actually, we're going to give away a premium format figure. Oh. So I need a name and an address because we didn't want to burden someone with something that large and heavy and fragile. <laughs> okay, so it's large, fragile, and um, heavy. So um, we've pre, um, predestined one of you to, um, totally at random, to um, walk home with that, but what's going to happen is um, Stacy's, my partner in crime here, is going to um, walk up to the lucky winner and she's going to take some information and Slideshow's going to ship the thing to you because it's too big to walk around. Name, name and address and phone number, please. <laughs> okay, and as that's happening, I'd like to introduce our next guest, uh, Brian Ono from EFX. Um, I feel the same about him. Um, so, so Brian, um, I have known you for quite a while now, but actually, I don't know how you first became a Star Wars fan, so can you tell me and my friends? <laughs> a little bit about how you came to love Star Wars so much. Um, the first time I was ever saw anything Star Wars was actually we were watching the Tower in Toronto, I think it was, and that's when we showed the trailer. And then the first time I saw it, I said, look kind of cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> but then I used to go to quite a few movies back in the day. I used to see about 100 movies a week, about a year. <laughs> I do have a little bit of a life, so a year. Uh, and I just kept seeing that same trailer over and over and got more and more intrigued by this trailer. So when it came out and as many of you guys opened up the Grimes Chinese Theater, only because I can't remember the name of the movie, but they didn't make the release date on time, so they put Star Wars on it. And I went to go see it and I just went, wow, that was something that I've never seen in the film before. So I actually ended up seeing, from May through September, Star Wars every weekend. <laughs> so if I were to count, not including any videos, I probably saw it about 38 times <laughs> in that time. So after that, as you can tell, I was hooked. <laughs> So um, speaking about the authenticity part, I, <laughs> I'm well aware of what a stickler you are for authenticity. So um, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, your your eye, your penchant for detail, and why that is. <laughs> I don't think there's a good reason why, <laughs> but. As far as Star Wars products go, as you can see, not only by the collector panel here, but all the other uh, merchandise that you see on the floor out there, 
there's a huge passion for Star Wars, and there is something in Star Wars in terms of product for everybody. So with us, as you know, we go for the higher end, more screen accurate uh, product, which addresses our customer base. So I remember back in the day when I was at Master Replicas, the CEO would always get mad at me because in his line was always the same thing. Because it, for the, it takes you know, a reasonable amount of time to do 90% of it. But that last 10% takes the same amount of time as to do that first 90%. And we'd always ask the same question. If you were to take the extra time to do that 10%, would we see it sell one more piece? I said, probably not. <laughs> but I always forced it so that we got the detail correct. Okay. So now moving on to the effects, we've had the pleasure of working with a lot of different people who are actually involved in production so that we can ensure the authenticity and the accuracy of the product. And we'll, we'll do as much research and work with as many people as we can in order to get it right. So what does that mean to you? Made me nuts. No, <laughs> no but actually, I, I'm just kidding here, because when you put out a product that you're proud of, I think that's one of the most important things as opposed to how many you sell, is that you have pride in the product that you make. Awesome, thank you. So uh, I know you have a slide show prepared as well, so. Okay. Unfortunately, Brian will let me put a picture of my new, my new dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's your dog's name? Yeah, um, her name is Jedi. Um, but she's still a pad one, and she will not be a Jedi until she can pee outside. Okay, so as you know, Mandalorian was a huge success, and for a lot of us, a lot of, a lot of us Star Wars fans, that was really a flashback to why we really love Star Wars. The story, the props, the costumes, the set, everything. Um, so with that, because of the success of our first Mandalorian helmets, we made a, uh, a PCR version of the helmet, which is at a, lot, a lower price point, but it has all the same detail as a limited edition one. This is the lightsaber. You can, people, I'm sure you recognize it as the one from Return of the Jedi. But this is the version as seen in the last scene of The Mandalorian. Because when Luke came back in that last season, you know how we all felt about that. <laughs> then, of course, for Mandalorian, also we have the armor helmet, which I thought was really a cool character. Um, and, it, and it's a beautiful helmet in <laughs> addition to that. How did you um, come about making this helmet? Well, this helmet, we were supplied with the actual master patterns cast from the same mold that was made to use the screen use helmet. Uh, like I said earlier, that we were very fortunate to work with the original model makers who, have, who worked closely with us to get these right. Then we have the Ahsoka Tano lightsabers. As many of you know who have been with us for what, 15 years now, uh, we did the Ahsoka lightsaber from Clone Wars. Uh, which did really well for us. So this is the, the Rosario Dawson version of the Ahsoka Tano lightsabers. Here's the Ahsoka helmet. So this is a little bit back in time to the Clone Wars, but this has always been a very popular clone helmet. And lastly, this is our exclusive. This is the uh, Grand Inquisitor uh, rank badge that will be seen in the Kenobi series starting tonight. And we are in booth, I don't know what our booth number is, we got, <laughs> it's either 2421 or 2423 if you look at different maps that has different numbers. Uh, but uh, come by and see what we got. So what's your giveaway today? Okay, what we're giving away today is, the first slide is remember we said we're making a PCR version of the Mando helmet. So the person who gets this will be the only person in the world that has one because all the rest are on a boat from China. <laughs> so uh, I did get production samples, so we're gonna give one away today and you'll be the only one who has one.
I think Gabe's a little jealous. <laughs> okay, so next we have Dan Luan from the incomparable Coda Bakia. So, um, I'd like to welcome Dan back to the panel. He hasn't uh, been on the panel for quite some time. We'll have another uh, uh, surprise for your parents. Um, so, um, Dan, um, you wanted me to ask you about a childhood memory of Star Wars that has recently come back into your life, and I'm intrigued by the answer. Yeah, so actually this is going to be a little show and tell for everyone. I have something here in my bag. So I went to my parents' house recently, and they had found some stuff that I guess I never picked up when I left, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and in this bag was actually, no, that was in the bag, um, this. And if you can see, this is Jabba the Hutt. And this was my Jabba the Hutt uh, when I was growing up. And I don't know, uh, you know, a lot of people think that maybe it was easier to get the, stuff, you know, the toys and, the, and, and you know, the Kenner figures back then. It was hard. It was hard to get that stuff back then. Because as a kid, I couldn't go to the store. I had to rely on my parents to take me to the store. And when I would go to the store, they never had it because it was always being, it was all bought up. So what I had was this. And this is actually a bubble bath container. You can <laughs> pop off the head and pour out your bubble bath. So this was my Jab of the Hut for the longest time. I finally did get the actual Kenner uh, Jab of the Hut, but for the longest time, this was my Jab of the Hut. So when I saw this in the bag, it just brought back so many memories and just, just memories of me using my imagination. And Star Wars is all about imagination. So having my figures around this Jab of the Hut, it was just some of the best times, you know, as a child. So really seeing this again brought back a lot of good memories for me. Awesome. <laughs> so I know that Code Vicky does some um, very, very special uh, items. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what authenticity means to you, um, as well as the design team uh, from Code Vicky? Sure, know, sure. They are pretty passionate. Yes, and I, we really, our, our, our main product developer from Japan really wanted to come to Celebration. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Um, but I actually have the honor of working with him, and I know that he is, a, he is so, uh, has just such an eye for detail. And we are constantly working with Brian to get either photo assets or digital assets. And sometimes, it, you know, it does get to be a pain to have to constantly ask for those assets. I, I know sending constant emails and Zoom calls, but that's what that, you know, why we're doing that, is to really put on, uh, put into the market the most accurate version of our artifacts and artifacts plus statues that we can. And of course, we're looking at to hit certain price points, so we can't go super overboard. So a lot of times, we've got to pull it back. We either have to scale back on the amount of details, extra parts we include, but we're always pushing that envelope, always trying to give the consumer and the fans like yourself the very best representation of whatever character, scene, uh, whatever we're making. So that's, that's really what uh, we strive for when we're, when we're making Star Wars collectibles. I noticed that you, um, you offer a, a breadth of experience where you have things that are super detailed and accurate in their detail, and then you have other things that are so accurate in the experience um, like the, the artist series. Yes. How, how, do you, how do you guys balance that? It, 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 is, it sometimes gets tricky because, um, but with the artist series, we really rely on the artist. So we, we fall back on what, this, what the artist's vision is, and we try to get that as exact as possible, even if it means kind of blurring the lines between what maybe was seen on the screen. When it when it's uh, when it's a you know a, either a Disney Plus or a, a movie collectible, we're focusing just on those assets that are available uh, that that you know appeared in, in the film or the or the TV show. But when it's an artist series release, we're we're really relying uh, very heavy on the artist to guide us in both color choice and sculpt and just overall pose because we're taking their artwork and transforming it into 3D. So we really have not only to, you know, we have to meet the needs of that artist to make sure that their artwork is being represented properly. I love, I love some of the, the stuff. I'm 
it's no secret my love of uh, ATSDPs from Guru. Oh yeah. Um, but um, I love how that stuff really balances. It's the authenticity of the experience. You could do something that isn't. We've never seen it in Star Wars, but it feels like Star Wars, and it still reminds us of the, the story that we love. For sure, it's it's really really some great storytelling that we're able to do via the artist and their interpretation of the character scene that we're doing with the artist series. Awesome. So I know that you all as well. Have we do. Yes. yes. Uh, and again, I, I want to thank everyone for coming out to celebration. Uh, we've had a, a a little break. It's been just. I've been at the booth and the crowds have been just tremendous. I mean, the traffic coming in and just uh, real interest in our products. So first of all, shameless plug. We do have an exclusive. We are sold out for today. So I mean, that was amazing. We will have quantities for tomorrow and Friday. This, this will not be available Sunday, unfortunately, because we're totally pretty much sold out of it. But it is the white armor version of Boba Fett inspired by his uh, screen test for uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, and that is at our booth 1408. I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because I know we have a lot of other great people up here that wanna talk about their products. So, But all of these are pretty much first time reveals and some of these um, are at our booth right now, is, uh, including this Boba Fett from the book Boba Fett. Now this is Artifacts Plus, and for those that are maybe not too familiar with our product lines for Star Wars, we have two main product lines. Artifacts Plus is one-tenth scale, and Artifacts is going to be one-seventh scale. Uh, they're PVC ABS plastic. Uh, with the Artifacts Plus, we tend to include a base that has an embedded magnet or steel plate with magnets in the feet, so you can kind of position it wherever you do like. So this is going to be our Artifacts Plus Boba Fett from the book of Boba Fett. Now, if you come to our booth, we actually have a grayscale model of him with his helmet off. And so that, uh, we didn't have time to uh, do, bring the paint master, but you can take a look at that at our booth. Uh, we also are completing our Bad Batch teams. So for the first time here, we're publicly showing Crosshair. Again, artifacts, so that's gonna be one set scale. Um, all our Bad Batch characters do have uh, two different portraits, so you can have them with the helmets on or off. And the base is somewhat unique because you can put pegs under the feet, so you can kind of position it wherever you like. It's kind of like a, a steel grate, so you can kind of move it around. And those uh, bases actually do kind of line up very well. So I'll show you this, uh, not this slide, but the next one. We're also doing Echo, and we're showing the Paint Master uh, of Echo here. So what that means is that's like a, 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 a one prototype. That is like, um, what we do is we will uh, have the 3D sculpt, we print it out, and then um, we'll have someone make a cast of it and we'll paint it, and then that's what we take the photos of and send it to Brian for approval. If you come to our booth, you'll notice that Echo is slightly larger than all the other Bad Batch. He will shrink once we actually go into production, so it will all look uniform. And then here's a scene with all our Bad Batch uh, members, um, and again, of course, Crosshairs, that's before Order 66, so uh, we know what happened that with that. So. Um, right now, we actually have Wrecker and Hunter available at our booth. Tech uh, will be arriving to retailers in a couple of months, and Crosshairs and Echo have not gone up for pre-order yet. Probably in the next uh, month or so, you'll start seeing pre-orders pop up for those two characters. Okay, so the next series of slides, we don't have really anything to show as far as prototype images, because these are first-time reveals, worldwide first-time reveals. Aren't you guys so lucky? So we're going to be doing our artifacts, one seven scale Boba Fett from the book of Boba Fett. I mean, kind of a no-brainer. Um, so uh, I don't know if the final concept has been final. You know, it has been finalized, but I believe he will be kind of stepping off uh, the throne room. Uh, we'll we're going to try to include as much of that environment as we can. Of course, we have to keep cost in mind. Um, uh, I don't know when the pre-order is going to open for, up for this. Maybe end of this year, uh, hopefully. We're also going to be doing Chrysanthemum, so I'm real excited to see this character added in one seventh scale. And then from the Clone Wars, we have two previous Clone Wars releases. Uh, that would be Ahsoka, and we have Captain Rex. So we're going to be adding Darth Maul, and I believe the plan is to have Darth Maul sculpted in a way that he can be facing off with Ahsoka and decide or already have her in your collection. And this one I'm really excited about. We're going to be doing Cad Bane and Toto. So 
Um, real, I, I was really pleased that uh, our team decided to go in this direction. This is going, again going to be from the Clone Wars. Um, and pre-orders are probably, I would say on this one, open up late this year or early next year. Uh, very early in, in what we're making, what these announcements that we're making. And of course, uh, we're excited to announce we will be supporting Obi-Wan Kenobi. And as a real true early treat, we're going to show you a shadow of a character we'll be making from that. I'm not going to disclose who it is. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a giveaway too, Brian. Oh, you have a giveaway? We do, and unlike Sideshow, we're not very considerate. So we brought it here. You will have to carry it home. <laughs> but I brought an IKEA bag. <laughs> And we are sold out of that too, so, uh, at our booth, so that's a real lucky, uh, let's give them a hand. <laughs> and finally, just again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come sit in this room and hear us talk about our products. Um, you can visit us on our social media, and uh, as always, may the force be with you. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. to welcome Dev Gilmore back to the panel. So I've known Dev for uh, also quite a long time. Um, so um, I also don't know how you came to be a Star Wars fan, and I'd just really love to hear that story. Classic story. Five-year-old kid, 1977, dad takes you to see Star Wars. It, amazing, changes your life. Everything you do from then on out is about Star Wars. And then you realize they make toys. <laughs> I just begged, I had to have that Tuscan Raider. That's the one, Sam, he must have, must have. I just begged my dad, he got it for me one day. And just, oh, was the, that was my problem. Right, right. You know, that, to me, was... A, perfect representation of what Star Wars was. I'm just running around my backyard and then I realized life's incomplete. I don't have no style. So I had to break every single bond on the block and I eventually got like the two dollars that it might have been to buy that figure and got that figure and I just, I couldn't stop. I just, just had to buy them all. I had to get everything. And just, you know, just love it. love Star Wars. I just couldn't wait. I remember thinking, if I die before Return of the Jedi comes out, like, I'm miss it. I'm a kid. Like, I shouldn't have these thoughts. <laughs> that anxiety, that pang of anxiety, because I might not see Return of the Jedi for some weird reason. Yeah, I love Star Wars ever since. So, um, it's uh, no secret you love Star Wars, and now you kind of um, get to work on it. So, how do you find the balance of mixing your pleasure with your profession? Yay. Um, well, it's, it's a lot. Um, it, I mean, it, it is true. Like, if you do what you love, you're, it's not really work. I mean, you know, we, we all are blessed and we get the opportunity to work on Star Wars. And even if it is 24-7, it doesn't seem to get old. And there's incredible new content all the time. I mean, the Mandalorian is a fantastic show. You know? And we get a new season of that coming. So it's great stuff. Um, so, uh, my common question, there seems to be a theme of authenticity going on here, so why don't you tell me what it means to you? When I started General Giant LTD, the idea was um, accuracy and detail, and that's how I viewed authenticity, because we were bringing digital scanning, 3D modeling, and 3D printing to the, the world of products. You know, no one had really done that yet, um, and we thought by 3D scanning the actual actors for being on set and the props, um, uh, any of the armor, that gave authenticity to the product that we were making. Um, as time went on, I started thinking about that Tuscan Vader figure and how that made me feel, and that feeling to me was authentic when I got that Tuscan Vader. So I thought, well, how do I capture that same feeling and that emotion and put that into a product? And so, well, we use that same digital scanning technology we've been doing and we started scanning the toys, and we enlarged those toys. And I was able to get a 12-inch version of that Tuscan Vader 
that to me felt as big and grand as it was when it was three and three quarter inches when I was a little kid. You know, so now I have this big giant version, and that became a successful line of product stores too. So you know, we really kind of went from full circle. It has to be on model character accurate to like let's make that toy that's really simple looking and like just capture that emotion again. So it's it's a lot of both just to you know just to be inspired by Star Wars. Awesome. Um, and now you have this. Oh, yeah, I got stuff to show. So, since we're talking about the jumbos and the 12 inch figures that we do currently do, uh, this is one of the uh, concept versions of Darth Vader. So, we kind of went back and looked at what we were doing. And, you know, you kind of do run the course with the, uh, the jumbo figures because there were only so many made. So, we kind of thought, well, if Ralph McQuarrie's original works actually did become what you see on screen, um, we wanted to see what that would look like if it was an actual action figure. Um, we actually referenced a lot of the EFX helmet to get that helmet to look pretty good. Also has the retractable lightsaber uh, and vinyl cape, just like the, the Darth Vader figure had uh, from 1977. And there's a Luke to accompany it. There's, there's no Tuscan Raider, but there is a Luke. Um, and Luke comes with a lightsaber, uh, has a clear visor, um, and again, you know, based off of Ralph McQuarrie's artwork. And we got Cobb Dan. Uh, he's currently wearing the boat with that arm uh, that he gets. Um, it's not a digital scan, but I think it's a very good likeness. It also comes with a um, alternate head that has the helmet on. And uh, the paint on this is really good if you get a chance to see it in person. Uh, the battle damage, all of the weathering, it really looks really sharp and thirsty. And as part of our 1-6 scale, uh, our core line of all of the uh, minibus that we've been doing for over 20 years. This one I love. Uh, it's obviously Ahsoka from the, uh, the, the climax of the last scene of Rebels um, when Sabine goes to meet with her. And you know, she's also got the owl on her shoulder, and you don't really know what's going to happen there. But this is going to come out um, around December. Um, it's just a great piece. It, it, you know, it just speaks for itself. I remember having a lot of conversations about this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did. We talked a long time about it. Yeah, really excellent one. And here we have Carrie Fisher's vouch. Uh, this piece has an alternate head, so you can take the helmet and put it on her head, and then we can uh, replace the helmet in her uh, right hand with a funnel bed there. It's our one seventh scale statue. And then we have the Clone Wars duel with uh, Dark Maul and Ahsoka. Uh, this is one of our one six scale milestone statues. And uh, the bases kind of work together so they can be displayed together, depending how you want to. Uh, Put them on your shelf. Um, got the clear lightsabers uh, and the battle damage on the uh, the bases, you know, from the uh, their classic. Mm -hmm. And we have a giveaway. So our giveaway is this uh, rise now on dark ray, and it has an alternate head in there. And here comes Stacy to some lucky winner. Who loves Stacy? <laughs> Everybody. Loves. I was thinking I probably should have had uh, Adam escorted in because it almost took that to get him to show up on the panel. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Adam's always one of my favorites. You're all my favorites. Thank you. <laughs> I say that to everyone. <laughs> okay, so Adam, I know that Star Wars means an awful lot to you. Um, and I know that you have some things in your life that have happened around Star Wars. So why don't you it, tell it, us? It feels a little bit like my destiny. I mean, my, my daughter, her name happens to be Leia, uh, was born on Force Friday, which at that time was September 4th in 2015. Um, my son, whose name happens to be Sky, um, as a tradition, uh, we, we bring him to um, Disneyland for his birthday every year. Uh, he wasn't born on Force Friday, but it was great because you know we missed a few years with the pandemic. But uh, it was our first time to, to Galaxy's Edge, um, so we we're hanging out at Black Spire uh, Outpost. Um, 
you know, I, I love A-Wings, um, but, uh, you know, I was connecting at a deeper archetypical, archetypical level, I guess. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the father, you know, who kind of takes Luke into the, the, the dark side, but for me, I think my son was, was, was pulling me there in a sense. I, I showed up in a, in a pork t-shirt, and, you know, those of you who've been at Black Spire, the first order stormtroopers aren't easy. They were, they were giving me a hard time. Um, my son, and I, know, I guess we're talking about soft lines, but he, he reached out to a, uh, and really wanted to get that, that first order officer's cap. He was just getting mad respect um, as he was going through there. You know, it's, you know, thank you for your support, thank you for your support, and I just, you know, I, I couldn't take it anymore. And I, I still had my inner pork, but I, I had to grab the hat, and I got the thank you for the support, and you know, I, I went full dark side, and I went carry on, carry on. Um, and so, um, yeah, I really felt the pull, but it was, it was great being in that immersive experience, and that's something that, you know, in our, in our booth design, I, I don't want this to be a shameless plug, but uh, I really wanted, you know, the, the tactile media that we make, um, I'm really hoping that it becomes part of that immersive experience, and um, yeah, hoping to, to show that off um, here at the celebration. So you found the porg you were looking for? I found the porg I was looking for, it's, it's, it's there. Um, so, yeah, the authenticity thing again, so um, I know that um, Bandai is infatuated with detail. <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little about, about Bandai and their trip around authenticity? Sure. I probably could just get right into the slides, but, um, you know, we're, I'll take you through Bandai Spirits um, brands, which are Bandai Hobby manufacturers in Japan. Um, there's um, a lot of, you don't need glue, there's a lot of technologies, but there's a massive attention to detail. Um, and there's also the interpretive series, um, Meisho Movie Realization, uh, it's designed by um, Takeyuki Takea, um, who does his own uh, samurai-esque or uh, feudal Japan uh, renditions that I'll take you through as well. Um, but, um, you know, I've been in his workshop before and it's amazing. I've been to the Shizuoka Hobby Center, the factory where they manufacture these things, and it's, it's just wonderful to see the, I guess, the cultural interpretations uh, that come out. Um, the, not only the attention to detail, but um, the culture that's imbued in some of these products from Bondi Spirits. Am I allowed to go through? You're a driver. Uh, so with that, as a segue, uh, not so clean, but fall 2022, um, we will have. This is. Uh, a 112 series, 112 scale series. Uh, it also incorporates cloth into this line as well. Um, so there's multiple, uh, there's the uh, face without the helmet, uh, interchangeable parts, and also it is articulated. Um, and also uh, coming out this fall is a 1-4 scale Grogu. Um, look at that, those interchangeable face parts uh, that you have, a lot of options. The eating one is my favorite. Um, <laughs> And you can see those, yeah, four different expressions. Uh, it also comes uh, with the hover pram uh, and a 112 scale, uh, sold separately uh, for the Mandalorian uh, model kit, but it comes with that 112 scale, so it is really two kits uh, in one. Um, again, these are the upcoming releases that are coming out from Bondi Hobby. Um, we're gonna get a little interactive as I go through this one. Uh, this is the May Show Realization Series, our favorite uh, samurai and feudal Japan takes uh, on our, our favorite Star Wars characters, uh, designed from um, the sculptor Takea. Um, and there's a lot of detail here. Uh, this is something we're displaying in the booth, the Daimyo, that's like the Lord of Lords, uh, Boba Fett in our booth. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's a lot of, I know we're getting a lot of questions, uh, but this, this is scheduled for release um, in early 2023. Um, the diorama is, is, is not for sale, but we're, we're definitely getting a lot of requests uh, to have diorama components, and there's a lot of detail on this diorama. I think I can approve that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, if everybody agrees. Yeah. Um, yeah, the mantle skull. Um, but um, yeah, so please, please definitely come check it out. Have a look at him on his grand full glory on the throne. Um, there's a lot of cool things there. Um, we're also doing where we have a bunch of uh, prototypes. Uh, I know a couple of them, like IG-11, uh, Juichi in this case, uh, the Shogun Akbar have been displayed before. Um, and so, I know a person, personal favorite of yours, Ryan, uh, the Gamorrean Guard we also have, the Nobushi. 
So I know some people want to clap, and we are doing a little uh, kind of a getting, you get to vote as your favorite political candidate, which one should get made next. Uh, there's little orange stickers you can put on there, and you actually get a free Meisho pin when you participate, so please come by the booth. But I think because you guys are here, one of the, the real things that I know our product developers are going to get feedback from is uh, how loud you get uh, when we go through each of these. So if you don't mind shouting out your favorite, um, it's difficult to pick them all, but uh, we'll start out first with Yojimbo, which means uh, bodyguard. Uh, this isn't the Lord of the Samurai. This is the, the this is the Mandalorian has his protecting Grogu. But uh, who here would like this one to be the next title from Nation of the Let's hear it. Right. Moving on, Shogun Akbar. Uh, this looks like a dude. Like it's not a helmet. Like there's somebody inside this thing. You'll notice there's like a hand inside the glove. Uh, but uh, Shogun Akbar, let's hear it. You All know right. that I can make the most noise when it comes I, to the Gamora. I know. <laughs> you gotta wait one more slide. Uh, but, uh, so this is um, the Ronin, or, or Lord of Samurai, IG. This is a really uh, fa fancy way to say Juichi, or Japanese, so I know a lot of fans of this droid, so let's let's hear it for those who want this one. IG. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, here you are. Gamorian Guard, no bushy Gamorian Guard. Who wants to see it? Yeah. Yeah. No bushy means kind of like a, a brigand, not more like a, a mercenary thug, uh, but that's kind of what it's saying. There's also a lot of cool weapons uh, in this one as well in the prototype, so please come in and uh, check them out at our booth. Um, and last but not least, the Remnant Stormtrooper. Um, I'm going to pull something up because this has been bugging me all day and I've been looking at it and I'm not being, I feel like I'm not being authentic, but I had, I can't memorize this word, the Camtano, am I pronouncing it right? You know, that holds the best art. Like, this is something that even moves me. And it's in the, it's in the Daimyo Boba Fett kid, but this guy looks like, as one of our, um, one of my colleagues explained him, like a zombie, like his armor is just thrashed. So this is the uh, Revenant Stormtrooper, let's hear it from Revenant Stormtrooper. And we also have the Funkochi exclusive out of the booth, Metallic Foundation. r 2 d Congratulations to the winners. Please come visit us at our booth. We're doing Razor Crest model kit workshops there. We have a full immersive uh, experience. Uh, that looks like a feudal samurai castle. Again, that survey, part of the Pin Grove program, and we do have the exclusive. Please come by and visit us. And uh, thanks so much. It's great to see you all. It's great to be back. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, it's uh, it's a spina tough. <laughs> Says no one. Says no one. Yeah. Okay, so you have a pretty special relationship with um, with Star Wars and Lucasfilm and the ranch and other places like that. Yeah. Um, so. You're also a fan, strangely enough. So you also really have to do this like everybody else here, but even more so makes this business and pleasure thing. Yeah. How's that working out for you? Pretty darn good. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a Star Wars fan since the first film came out. Um, you know, I, I've... I was a fan before I even saw the movie because my folks, you know, even though it was at a theater near us, as the, the trailer always said, my folks got me the storybook so I could read it instead. Thanks. Uh, but it actually worked out because as I flipped through the storybook, I got to the page where it had the, the spread of the Cantina aliens, and there were those two Doros looking right at the camera, and Muff Tack and all of that stuff, and the Doros scared the heck out of me the first time because I was like five. And so I, you know, you'd, you'd like look through your fingers out, and you'd turn the page, and you'd go back. And I'm so fascinated by those monsters, and I had these weirdly practical parents who, you know, I don't think they were intentionally trying to destroy any mystery or anything like this, but you know, they made it clear to me this was make believe. Someone made that, and I was like, wait, what? 
someone made that, you say. I'm gonna make this for a living. And they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't mean it like that. You're gonna grow up and you're gonna have to be a, a lawyer or an accountant or a cop or something. I'm like, no, 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 you've met me, I'm not gonna be a cop. I'm gonna make monsters. And, you know, it's, it's I think, the path of any creative, you see what's in front of you and you make the best of it and you try to, uh, for whatever, carve your own path and that's, that's, it was a long and winding path to get here, but that's, that's kind of what I got to do, and I feel pretty darn lucky about it. So you've um, actually, uh, uh, one of the companies that you have has actually reconditioned a lot of the things from the movies recently. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, it's funny, I, every once in a while, you know, folks want to, you know, like, talk at a school or something, and you just go like, okay, kids, here's what you do. Quit school and join the Muppets. It worked for me. Um, <laughs> So, you know, my first gig was, you know, I, I left college because I had I'd started a puppet company, I'd gotten an internship with the Henson folks, and I got to know a whole bunch of people doing wildly creative stuff for a living. And that was really, really eye-opening, you know, to, to, to go from, you know, someone made that to seeing people make that. It makes it real, it makes it like, oh, that's achievable, I can do that. And so, that was my first step into the business. I worked in television for a while as a technical director, and all the while, prop collecting really started to, to take hold, like original film props. It started with like replicas. I mean, for me, even as a kid, Don Post was like, you know, I loved all the action figures, but when I got a Don Post Cantina band guy head, like, I thought I was holding a prop from the movie in my hands. And then you flash forward like 20 years, and I'm holding a prop from the movie in my hands, and I'm freaking out. And I, you know, I, I built up this company all the while that was restoring original film props. Turned out to be something I had an app for. I did a ton of research, developing new techniques, all this stuff, and found this niche in this new field of collecting, or this at least expanding field of collecting at the time. And that was realizing, hey, these people need to display this stuff. These people need to conserve this stuff. Sometimes it needs to be restored. And me as a sculptor, a guy who makes monsters, had the, the particular talents necessary for it. And so yeah, you know, some of the highlights of my career doing that are working for, uh, whether it's collectors or auction houses and things like that, but that ultimately the Lucasfilm archives. And I thought you were gonna say look working with me. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do that in front of people, oh, Ryan. I appreciate it. The other guys will get jealous. <laughs> so really, what, is it, what does it mean to you to take that experience and be able to share that through Everything. what you do with people yeah. like me? Yeah, I mean, you know, you keep talking authenticity, right? There is a feeling you get when you see an original prop from a film. I. I it's hard to put into words. There's no, I, I, it, you can't get a more direct connection to the film than having something in front of you that was the thing on that screen. It's hard to put into words. It's like being around a celebrity, you know? And for me, the celebrities are not just the props, but the people who made them. Um, and over the years in restoring this stuff and in working with Lucasfilm Creating Monsters, commercials, and whatever else, I've gotten to know a bunch of these guys. Guys were my heroes, you know. I wasn't the kid who wanted to be Luke Skywalker, I was the kid who wanted to be Rick Baker and Stuart Freeborn. And like, all my friends were like, uh, I'll be Han Solo, I got the gun. And I'm like, I'm Rick Baker, I got sculpting tools, jump out. Um, and it's just, to, to come all this way, to bring all, like, it, it's almost like one of those things where, you know, there's a thing with a plumber where you tell him like, oh, you know, it's, you only did one hour's worth of work, why is it $400? And it's like, because of the 30 years of experience I have, that's why. And it's, it's that same way with this stuff, you know, everything we do is the culmination of our experience as a fan, as a maker, as a restoration artist, as the head of a crew of people that are like, just so good at what they do, and out there making me look great all the time. You know, people coming up to me at the booth, and they're like, oh man, I, you know, I love this. And I'm just like, Maria's right here, she painted it. You know, like, go thank her. Um, and that's, that, that's a big part of authenticity to me. I don't know if that really answered the question or not, but 
Oh, no, but that was okay. All right, go ahead. So, um, did, um, tell us about some of the recent challenges oh, you've experienced. <laughs> There's everything is, you know, that's the other thing about authenticity. It's about being, uh, oh, what should we do? Yeah, there we go. Hey, I'm going to cheer for Regal Robot. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Here, round of applause. How many people have you uh, already, because we're kind of the new kid on the block, how many people already knew about my company out there? Everybody else, welcome. Nice to meet you. Um, what was the question? <laughs> so, Jeff, yeah, I mean, it's about you have to be willing to redo stuff. It's about going back and fixing your mistakes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. You know, like if you went to the Lucasfilm archives and, and scanned the wrong Tuscan Raider. Um, you know, so we, we recently had a project where we're working on a Tuscan Raider, uh, life size one to one bust. And went through, you know, and sometimes you go there and they'll do a pull list for you, they'll pull a piece out, and you're like just amazed to be in front of these things. And so you're like, oh, this is amazing, we'll scan this, this is going to be so good, oh, it's so cool. And then you go back and you start looking through reference books and you're like, wait a minute, they had two of them there, and the other one matches all of these photos. And it's like, that's the cooler one. All right, we're going back. And it, you know, like, yeah, twist my arm, I have to go back to the art guys. Yeah, yeah, no, Brian, it's because of authenticity, we have to go back. Oh, okay. I showed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dev would have been really upset had you gotten the wrong one. Oh, no, of course. Yeah, nobody would want it. The other one was garbage. So. <laughs> Should I go to slides? Um, your choice. You want to keep talking? No. Okay. All right. All right. I'll, I'll flip pretty quick. I, we've been keeping these people away for a long time. So, um, all the, the stuff that we've been just talking about in terms of scanning things and everything, this is all part of our new archive collection. It really is, we've called it the uh, evolution and expansion and continuation of stuff we've really already been doing. Over the years we've released stuff like um, the uh, Rancor prop replica, which was scanned off the original CC3 prop replica bus, scanned off the original. Uh, we've released things like uh, the Tauntaun maquette, which we've got down in our booth that came out of Phil Tippett's original molds. Um, we've done some stuff, and we have some stuff coming up that are coming out of molds that were used to make things for shows. So these are some of those things. The, uh, the hollow chest set there are all one-to-ones, the original puppets, using the digital scans and things that Phil Tippett's team did when they remade the chest set for uh, The Force Awakens. And this really is, you know, I think it's the ultimate expression of what we've just been doing all along, what you and I have been building along with, I'll, I'll point out Rob in the audience, my, my creative director that sits in the office with me and we beat our heads against the wall making this stuff and everybody on the crew. Um, so this is the first official archive collection piece, the Max Rebo concept of Get Replica, uh, AKA Red Ball Jet. At the show we've got a, a signature edition with Phil Tippett's signature. We've got 83 of those here. And actually as of today we've only got 43 of those here, something along those lines. Uh, they went extremely fast this morning, so we're just releasing a few more uh, tomorrow and Saturday, so if it's something you want to get, please visit us at the booth. Uh, the numbered edition will be coming out June 7th. That'll be available for pre-order on the website, RegalRobot.com. Um, and this is just, you know, I love going back, so that's that's still on the left, is, you know, from Star Wars to Jedi, the making of a saga, Gabe brought it up. I wore that tape out. I mean, those guys are, like Phil Tippett, he's a rock star, look at him. And what I love about this is on the picture on the right, the shadow person that he drew to, to scale up the costume is totally Phil's profile right there. <laughs> he's even got a little grumpy mouth. Um, also, the next Rebo only has legs. He doesn't have, or, or arms, or whatever those are. Like, there's no more of them. The Kenner figure was wrong. Like, this is actually his whole of anatomy. But that's another thing. Uh, the next one up after that is going to be the Bib Fortuna concept. Again, these are pulled from the original concept maquettes that were used to create the creatures during the, the uh, production of Return of the Jedi. Um, we're really lucky the archive saved all of this wonderful concept art, all of these things that, you know, Bib Fortuna doesn't exist if some artist didn't create this weird, funky maquette of it. And I love that stuff. I love that it's offbeat. You know, there's, it's great to have the, the representation and the figures and things like that that look exactly like the screen, but like Dev was even saying, uh, you know, uh, was it you with the Tuscan Raider? Yeah. 
like, you know, there's a, there's a feeling to the original thing, and to, to go back and mine that, and to give us some variety on the shelves, right? These are amazing. So this is Phil Tippett's original concepts for the Tauntaun. And they're all like dragony and ram-like and stuff, and some of them are even sculpted different on each side because he was just trying different things. And all of these were still at the archives, and we managed to get really great digital scans of them and bring them back. And, and there's a vintage picture on the top left. And it's just to line these up the first time after we, we had them in our shop and, and like we had prototyped them and line them up like that picture was just like, oh my god, that's that's the picture from the book. Um, now that's an unpainted prototype. This is also down at the booth if you want to come and get a sneak peek. This is the weak way maquette, another from the series. All of the, you know, this is how those characters were made. I just love this stuff. Um, and this is showing them in with some of the other maquettes we've done. We've done the job of the hut that sold out a little uh, about a year ago. We still got the Tauntaun maquette again out of Phil Tippett's original molds from 1980, no, 1978. Um, and then that Gamorrean is actually a Mandalorian concept sculpt by Tony McVeigh, who created uh, Salacious Crumb and the giant scale Rancor hand and stuff for Return of the Jedi. They brought him back to do concept work, and those original molds are still around, so our stuff has direct lineage to this. This is our next one to one bus. This is also down at the booth, 2518. Big plug, come see us. No shame. Um, this is one to one to the original prop. This is the second one that we scanned because we had to. We had to go back. And, uh, you know, just really, really heavy into the detail on this. The weathering had to be right. The shredding on the, the edges had to be right. We tried all different variations on this stuff. Just to get the color right on the wraps was an amazing challenge. And, uh, you know, Anybody that's ever had to dye fabric knows it's alchemy. Like there is, there is, there are no laws of science and nature that apply when you're dyeing fabric. Um, and one of the cool things here is, you know, the mouth section there. So these are real metal machine parts on, on all the metal parts, but all of the quote leather is actually resin because we had that scan and we wanted to make sure every wrinkle matched up to the real prop when you got it. So we just did a really cool tech paint on it to make sure it felt like real leather when you looked at it. Um, keeping with the Tuscan theme. Uh, and here's another neat one when it turned, talk about authenticity. So in the archives, they've got one of the Gaffey sticks, but it's in the configuration it was after Star Wars, which meant the, the pineapple end horn had broken off and been sharpened and kind of shortened. And the end with the spike was a little shorter. And what was neat was, I have another picture going yeah. What was neat was, we found that the Rancor Keeper staff was out of the same mold as the hero Gaffy stick. And so what we did was we scanned the, you know, quote, better of the two, the, the New Hope Gaffy, but then we scanned the point off of the Rancor Keeper one because it had the intact, unbroken point. So we could do the, the hero Peter Diamond look, uh, Tuscan Raider Gaffy, and I'll, I'll go back one. So the metal end on this is real welded steel. Everything else is resin painted to look like wood, and the original props on these were resin. These were duplicates made by Bapti. You know, they probably had a real uh, Tokia uh, from, from Fiji that they had molded years ago, but the ones used in Star Wars were resin. Um, and now, one of the things my company gets to do is make some props for shows every now and again. Uh, if you saw Book of Boba Fett, you probably saw some of our monsters in there. Brian Seif did the makeup for the show, and they did an amazing job painting them, but like, we did a Van Guy head, and, uh, a snaggle tooth and a cave uh, shotgun fan and stuff like that. And when they went to do the Tuscan Raiders for Mandalorian, they needed Gaffy sticks. They came to us for the Totopia part of it, which we had a mold of a replica that I had done years ago. Um, and so from that mold, we were able to make our replica of that particular Gaffy stick and you know really give you something that's just the closest thing you can get to the real prop. Great lineage. Um, these are old Gaffy sticks are on display with 2518. Please come see them. Um, and those will be coming out uh, in late summer. Uh, uh, I think mid, mid to late summer is the uh, Tuscan bus and then that. We also have a decor line. And unlike, you know, we, as you can probably tell from what you're looking at, we like to have fun with it. <laughs> So we came up with the separation collection. Um, because everybody knows, you know, one of the most famous things that Star Wars is it's a lot of cut-off limbs. It's a kid's movie. 
Um, so uh, we, we thought it'd be fun to explore a little of that, and, and it has been a lot of fun. All of these magnets are, are uh, resin, a lot of them are hand cast, they're all hand painted and things like that right in our studio. Um, if you come down, you'll see Marie at the booth, tell her, great job painting that, it looks like real metal. Um, and so yeah, so you've got everything from you know these limbs, you've got the parts of the galaxy, which is a little more proppy. Um, that's R2-D2's hollow projector, uh, restraining bolt, the gargoyle from Boba Fett's throne, the Mando grab charge, and of course the switch that kills the Rancor and the skull that was thrown at it, and uh, just because we're ridiculous. Um, some more of our decor stuff, we do a lot of wall art. All of this stuff is down at the booth to see. The, uh, the, the tower ring based on Jabba's dais is a pretty cool one, and we get a lot of cool, uh, a lot of good feedback on that. And everybody loves Boba Fett and Mando, and uh, Mio Nakamura did a beautiful hand sculpt on the big uh, bone skull there, and a the small one, and Tony Cipriano did a digital sculpt of a mudhorn skull. Do you still um, have the door knocker? No, the door knocker we had to, had to uh, discontinue. Yeah, the, it was the thing with metal prices, it just, we couldn't get it at the price we wanted anymore. But we had done a version of that as a, an actual metal door knocker. Um, this is a really cool new piece, and this is another one based on a scan from the archives. This thing is about six or seven feet long, the real problem. Uh, so we're doing a wall decor piece and a magnet that's about five inches. If anybody, show of hands, who, who's even seen this before? Like, this is a deep cut. I got, I got two, but he works for me. Three, four, all right, oh god. Yeah, a few, all right. So this is in Java's sail barge, way in the back, and you barely see the movie, but one day we're in the archives and we look at it, there's a seven foot long, amazing bronze rancor, and it's like, oh, we've got to do something with this. So, we are. Um, like, and like I said before, it's good. Like, it's good to work on this stuff. Um, uh, we also have all kinds of furniture for your home. Check out the website. It's every, you know, the, the room on the right might look familiar from some super fans room <laughs> over there. Also, was, were, were any of the other panelists up here looking at Gabe's picture and counting their pieces in it? Like, that's ours, that's ours, that's on mine. We did that. I painted that. Um, and this is the, the newest furniture piece. We've got a pair of these at the table. These are cantina-inspired seating. Uh, we've, we've done these as props for commercials and things in the past, years ago. These are like actual, functional, comfortable, real furniture. Um, come sit on them. It'll be great. You've been walking around a lot. It'll be nice. You brag to your friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're, they're, they're just, I like, I like that they're kind of a little bit like you know, mid-century modern, just kind of like a sleek, simple bench chair. You put them in your house, don't even tell anyone they're so old, you know? Um, so yeah, come see all the new stuff. We're down at booth 2518. Uh, and let's see here, we do have exclusives. Here's my totally no shame plug. The Wise Monkey Lizard's desk accessory, because again, we're ridiculous. Uh, we've been working on, we, we uh, have been doing these life-size one-to-one salacious prop, prop replicas, and the idea of like, mm, monkey lizard, monkey lizard, mm, leads to things like that. The Walrus, Arm, uh, Walrus Man Arm two-pack up magnets is available at the booth. The Blue Harvest Wood Art plaque, all of that stuff, come pick it up. And Max Revo, if you're gonna try, just get there early, otherwise, Hit up the website in June, you'll get the numbered edition. And this is our giveaway. It's a deluxe resin DocuBay 94 wall plaque. And, and there's also a Rico Robot t-shirt. And, and show of hands, how many people saw that 94 in the movie? Like, how many knew it was there? Like. Years went by, and then someone pointed it out, and I had to watch the movie again. I'm like, son of a gun, it's carved in the wall, it's like six feet tall. And so, of course, we made a plaque out of it. So, there you go, that's us. Thank you so much. So, I'd like to thank everybody for participating on the panel, and I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And hopefully you learn a little bit about the, the passion that goes into the, the experiential items that these people offer, what it means to them to be able to share that with you. Thank you very much and enjoy the convention.